anything less than like a week or two. I don't consider it touring. It's just kind of like these one offs where we like fly in, play a show, fly back home. Yeah. I'm usually gone for about 24 hours. Is that like by design? You yeah, prefer it that way? Yeah. You don't like to be gone? Yeah. We're, all, we're only hard. doing about 72 shows this year. Yeah. So I'm home almost 300 days a year now. And with, with the kiddo, that's, that's, awesome. that's the priority. Yeah. Is, is making sure me and her stay close. Yeah. And she gets to go on the road with me um, quite a bit. I'd say probably half the touring I've done this year, Pearl's been there with me. So she's uh, she's seen the country. It's um, I think it's a, I, I didn't get to see the country until I was in my twenties. She's already been to forty some states. Some people never get to see yeah, the country. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. How old is Pearl? Four. That's awesome. And so she's uh, she loves being on the bus. She loves the band takes really good care of her. No, yeah. my pedal steel player is teaching her how to skateboard. <laughs> so uh, she's got like a little skateboard at home. It's so weird to see her like in like a little princess dress and a crown, fucking just dropping the board down, <laughs> I love jumping that. on. It. I was like, kid, I fucking love you. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. Oh yeah, it's, it's pretty rad. That's the stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Stuff that, like, uh, yeah. yeah it's, yeah. That stuff never gets old for me. I mean, that's cool though. Four years old and already been to that many states. And then I, I probably was in my 20s as well. You know, the first time I really started getting out. And, yeah, my first know. tour was the first time I really got outside of the South. Yeah. First time, you know, blindly driving west, you know, just driving through Texas and, you know, New Mexico and Arizona and California and doing touristy shit in every single place, just stopping and seeing. Get out of the way. The yeah. ne next time you go back, you're like, look at the touristy shit. Yeah, well, these I, st I, still do, I still do the touristy shit. It's I, fun, I love know? the touristy shit, uh, especially if I've never been there. Like That's the first thing I want to do is like, what's the cheesy thing yeah. that uh, you know, has the most like Yelp reviews? I want to go do that for a second. I'm not going to lie. The first time I went, first time I went down to Nashville. Yeah. Just like all the honky tonks. Go to Broadway. Yeah. To Broadway. I think everybody goes to you Broadway. You have to, the first right? Time it's fun. And then um, uh, from time to time, I'll still, you know, go to some of them. It's, it's cool because whether it's true or not, there's the thought that, oh, man, like Waylon, Waylon and, and Johnny were hanging out in that alley. Yeah. El Elvis was over there once. I don't know if there's any truth to it. If but you that's get what close to the Ryman, that's totally true. That, yeah. that alley behind the Ryman going to Tootsie's, that's, that's legendary. Yeah. That's, uh, that's your best shot of standing <laughs> in the same place as the heroes. It's a, cool, it's a cool thought, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about your first tour that you that you went out on and really started seeing the country. Was that was that with American Aquarium, or was that? Um, yeah, um, I've never been in another band. American yeah. Aquarium is the first band I ever had. Um, that's still going. So yeah. I'm, I'm lucky. I have so many friends who who have been. Are we rolling? Yep. We're rolling. We are rolling. Yeah, we're rolling. He's going. Uh, he doesn't tell us. We just yeah. Uh, he catches me in conversation. Up, and just goes. Up. Yeah, yeah, I'm we're into going. it. Um, yeah. Yeah, we uh, we started the band, and uh, everybody else in my band has been in you know multiple bands. But American Aquarium was my first band, and I started it in two thousand you know six. It was when our first record came out. Yeah, and uh, I've been lucky. I've just kind of had this, you know, I've got to play under the same name. I had a bunch of different band members, but I've got to play under the same name. So. Well, it's interesting because you're the the one constant. Yeah, it's you. I'm the song. I'm the guy that wrote all the songs. I'm yeah. the guy that sings all the songs. So it's like, do you feel? I know people that look at, and this is no disrespect to everybody else that's been in the band because they're amazing musicians, but you are American Aquarium to a lot of people that they feel that way. How do you feel when people say that to you? Um, I used to feel weird about it. Yeah. And then we had the massive change in 2017 where every single member quit the band and I kept it going. Mm -hmm. And we never skipped a beat. No. That was when it became very clear that like a lot of these people... They're not coming to see individual members of band, the band. And if they did, they might not come to the shows anymore. We might lose two or three people in every town that were just there to see, you know, Bill play bass or Kevin on drums or Ryan on guitar. Yeah. Um, what we learned is people want to come hear the songs. And as long as I'm singing the songs, as long as I'm willing to sing the songs that they love, they're willing to keep coming seeing the band. So it became very clear that American Aquarium is kind of just, you know, it's the, it, it's the, the vessel in which I deliver songs because I never wanted to be that guy who's, you know, BJ Barm and the something sums, you know, yeah. I never wanted to be that guy. Um, I always wanted to have kind of this band moniker, but it's becoming very clear, especially 2022 that American Aquarium will always just be a vessel for my songwriting and whoever I decide to be standing behind me playing the songs. Um, but as long as I'm willing to go out there and play the songs every night, you know, 
Yeah. I'm the only original member that was ever in the band. You know, as and that's long- something you couldn't replace. You can't. Yeah. Repl- if you're the the chief songwriter and the voice of the band, if you were to leave and somebody else were to carry on that name, it that would lose the fan base. That would not be the same. But yeah. it's, it's I find that it's easier with a band as talented as a drummer may be, as talented as a guitarist may be, as long as the front man, the face of the band is there and keeps it going. That's I think one of my people invested. One of my friends said it and I didn't really think about it, but they were like, name a band you really like. And so I named a band I really liked. Like, what's the bass player's name? I was like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, what's the drummer's name? I don't know. Do you know the singer's name? Yeah, here, this is the singer's name. This is where he's from. This is yeah. how many records he has. <laughs> and they're like, see? Yeah. And it's like, it's no disrespect. Not to, at all. To the side guys. Not at all. Yeah, but it's Not like, uh, you know, unless, again, unless you're fr- friends with the individual band member, and the only reason you're coming to the show is because of your friendship, mm-hmm. most people are coming to the shows to hear the songs. And as long as the guy who wrote the songs is still willing to sing the songs, they're kind of okay with whoever's backing them. And and that, and that was a lesson that I didn't believe. I thought that for sure when everybody quit that that was going to be the demise. Mm-hmm. But my wife sat me down and was like, as long as you're willing to do this, this is your band, this is the thing you started, as long as you're willing to do it, I promise you people are still going to show up. And so we put a new band together and went out, and I'm not even kidding, like didn't even skip a beat, like – went back on tour so that band quit in february of 17 i did the great 48 in may june and july of 17 in august of 17 a completely brand new band went back out and numbers just kept going up yeah it was like nobody it was like a no we didn't even pause it's interesting i i think the only reason that i knew I be I don't did you guys did you even release a statement or anything? The only reason I think that I knew is because Bill and I are Facebook friends. I released and I, he said I, I released about one it. statement that was, you know, these guys have decided to leave, um, you know, after, you know, seven to ten years respectively of people who'd been in the band. I was like, they've decided to move forward. I was like, if you guys know anything about me, I was like, quitting is not my, my thing. I was like, I promise I'll keep playing songs. I'll promise I'll keep it going in some capacity. I don't know yet what. It was a very ambiguous statement. It was, right. guys, I'm going to keep doing this. I just got to figure out how I'm going to keep doing this. So thanks for your patience. And sure enough, within within six months of them quitting, we were back on the road full time, and we haven't let off the gas yet. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there almost a very similar situation in 2012? Didn't you guys almost hang it up? Yeah, I that I was. That I think, uh, yeah, that was a trial run of everybody quitting. Yeah, uh, everybody. We decided that. 2012 everybody quit the band um because we weren't going anywhere it wasn't nobody was making any money nobody was everybody was like ruining relationships and going into financial ruin um and we decided that we were done but we had just made a record with jason isbel called burn flicker die and then when that record came out we started selling out shows it's amazing. And record. everybody in the band kind of retracted their <laughs> retracted their their notice. Yeah. Um, we had one guy still quit before Burn Flicker Die came out. Um, but the rest of the band kind of, you know, retracted their their two weeks notice and uh and and we kept it together for another, you know, five years. But like that band was it was so volatile. And I was drinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a different person. I was a monster of a human being. Um I was a hard friend to be around I was a hard boss to work for um so those guys it's a miracle that they stuck around another five years but I call it a trial run because in 2012 everybody quit and then in 2017 everybody quit but this time it was like for real like everybody was yeah. done done well, it's interesting because at that point that run was the most successful that the band had, had up to that point right? yeah 2017 everyone was making a substantial amount of money compared. you guys had some some real hits yeah, in 2017, yeah. everybody was making a good paycheck every week. Um, we were comfortable. Everybody had – nobody had to work a job. Everybody was getting paid properly. Um, kind of what you hope for when you start a band yeah, is yeah. to be able to get to a point where music takes care of everything. All of your needs are taken care of because of the songs you play. And like I said, I think I did so much damage um, to those friendships through all the drinking years and all the just being a, a bad friend. Um, 
that even the, no amount of money was going to keep those guys there. They knew it wasn't over. They knew it wasn't stagnant. They knew they saw the growth. Our, our we've been very fortunate. Our band's growth has always been. It's not not been like straight up exponential, but it's definitely been like slow growth exponential. Um, turning two fans into four fans and eight fans and 16. And once you get to 100, it's easy to turn 100 into 200, 200 into 400, 400 into 800. And that's where we're at now is, yeah. you know, every night we're playing somewhere between, you know, three and 600 people every night. Um, Which is no small task to go yeah. across the country and to be able to do that. Especially, you I know, mean, there's no radio single. There's no major label support. There's no – this is all grassroots. This is all built from the ground up. Yeah. So the foundation is so strong with our band. Like our foundational fan base is just, it's the kind of people that on this tour have seen us five times, took a whole weekend and drove and did, you know, Minneapolis, Chicago, Milwaukee. Uh, it's dedication. You know, that kind of like, like casual fans will see you once every two or three years when you have a new record coming out. But like we have groups of fans that literally have seen us hundreds of times hundreds of times they've yeah. seen us play live so knowing that obviously when you have a new record out you want to play the stuff off that record you want to highlight it but knowing that you have a fan base that follows you like that do you try to pepper in some of the the fan favorites and the deep cuts that you wouldn't necessarily do uh set list changes every night that's um, awesome we have 132 songs that we've released over 16 years um we have 83 or 84 songs that are always up for play every single night we don't play the first two records just because I'm not that person anymore. I'm, I'm not proud of the songs. I'm not, I, I hadn't found a voice yet. Um, so I'd say from Dances for the Lonely, 2008's Dance for the Lonely on, we can play just about every single song we've recorded. The, the new band knows every song. We spent the pandemic learning the whole catalog because we, yeah. we never wanted to be that band where somebody shows up and requests a song. We didn't know how to play it. <laughs> so we know the whole catalog now. And uh, every night, there's probably 10 songs we have to play. You have to play, Burn, Flicker, Die. You have to play Losing Side of 25. You have to play Casualties. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, we we sprinkle in a lot of deep cuts because, like you said, it took me a very long – because, you know, artists are egotistical assholes, and we think that our new material is the best material. And everything that came before our new material is just the garbage that led us to our current state of brilliance. And that's how we operate. And it took me a very long time to realize that – some of those fans out there found us in 2008 and their record is Dancing for the Lonely. And there's some people that found us in 2012 and their records burn, flicker, and die. And uh, I know how I feel when I go to see my favorite bands and they only want to play the new stuff. Yeah. And you're like, man, I wish they'd play something off that record that got me through that first breakup or got me through that loss of a parent or through that, like, through these big life moments. And that's why every night we play at least two songs of every record since 2008. That's because cool. I tell people, I'm like, you might not hear your favorite song, but you'll at least hear a couple songs off your favorite record. <laughs> and I want people to leave. I want to remind people why they fell in love with this band every night. And if you're just playing the new stuff, you might not hit that guy that's been there since 2008 that really wanted to hear something off dances. But if you play a couple songs off every record, they leave reminded why they love your band. Like renewed. Yeah. Why they love your band. That's really cool. And it's very, you know, aware of your fan base, uh, to be able to do that. Like I, I said, that took really time. Cool. That took time. Yeah. I was, I used to be the guy who was like, we're playing what I want to play. We're playing all the new stuff. The stuff you were excited about. Yeah. The stuff you're yeah. excited about. Your newest stuff is the stuff you're so excited about because in your mind, as an artist, as a creator, it's your best stuff because it's a craft and everything's supposed to trend in that direction. Today's song's supposed to be better than yesterday's songs. Tomorrow's songs are going to be better than yeah. today's songs. And so you only want to play your new best stuff, but then you forget that there's that guy, that there's that one song from 2008 that literally got him through a divorce. Or that, that one song from 2012 that caused that guy to quit his day job and pursue, you know, his love of insert whatever his love is, you know. And as an artist, I think it's it's our job to to remind people every night, like, why they paid the 25 bucks to get in the door and see the band they've seen 10 times. Like, It'd be so boring to go see the same show every single night. Like every night our set list changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I post it every day. That's really cool. I post the set yeah. list every night to, to remind people. It's like, this isn't what we played the night before. It's and that's not what we experience. played the night before. It's like every single night is a is a an extremely unique experience. Um, that could be the same as something a couple of weeks ago, but we sit down as a band and we curate something special, 
hopefully for each and every show. That's really cool. And you're talking about, you know, the, the songs that people have relationships with. I discovered you guys, I think with the burn flicker die era, Yeah. but a song and I love your rock and stuff, but something that is really special for me and my wife, uh, when we got married, we made uh, wedding mixtapes. Oh, Old that's scene, awesome. And we passed out to all the guests and man, I'm supposed to be, yeah, was on that. Yeah. It's a special song for us. You know what I mean? So everybody's got those things. Um, luckily the new stuff, is really freaking good. I mean, yeah. Uh, Chicken Macomico? Ch- nailed it. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> nailed it. I, pra- I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to the song. I'm like, all right, make sure I said it. that is. Yeah, you nailed it. So that's that's a beautiful song, heartbreakingly so. Yeah, it's a grown up record. It, it is. It's um the record is is a little different. Yeah. It's a little different. That's how you say it. It's a grown up grown up record, huh? Our goal is to never have a record that sounds like a another record we have yeah um i've got a lot of friends that they put records out and when they find a record that's successful they just replicate it like six times with different words and like fugazi yeah like when you <laughs> just find the same thing over when you over. find something you like uh or something that people like or something that starts paying your bills you tend to want to just keep replicating that until it doesn't uh and and i'm not that guy like i want every record to sound different like if you listen to burn figure die it sounds totally different than small town hymns which is the record before it was like a kind of a country folk record mm-hmm. and then after burn figure die was wolves which is like this really weird kind of experimental indie rock record yeah and yeah and the goal is to never have the same like wolves and burn figure die you can obviously tell it's the same person singing but it shows growth hopefully yeah um same way with Chicken Macomico. Chicken Macomico is a record about loss. It's a record about losing a parent, losing friends, losing time, losing experience. Um, it's a pandemic record, obviously, but um, you know, I wrote about some challenging stuff: the loss of my mom, the loss of my grandmother, me and my wife's miscarriage. Um, I wrote about a lot of stuff that you know the burn, flicker, die guy probably didn't have the capacity to write about. Um, I couldn't have wrote those songs in 2012. Just like I can't write burn, I couldn't write burn, flicker, die in 2022. It's a totally t- different time human, and a place, totally different yeah. human being. But it's fun to look back because those records serve as almost like yearbooks, like these chronological snapshots of, of where I've been, who I was at those times. And so, you know, whenever there's a kid who's like, I see a 22 year old kid getting fucked up at the bar and, you know, chasing girls and, and, you know, burning the candle at both ends. I'm like, man, I got a record for you. Like, here's <laughs> here's where I was when I was your yeah. age. That might resonate with you. Yeah. I was like, in 10 years when you start a family and decide to slow it down, here's a record that's going to resonate with you. Um, and that's the goal is just writing as honest as I can about my experience. Because what I've learned over the years is when I'm honest about what I, when I'm transparent, when I'm truly being real with people in songs, they can apply that to their life so much easier than me trying to write songs that I think they might want to hear. Yeah. Like, if, like it would just be a joke if I'm the 38 year old guy writing about still getting fucked up at the bar and chasing girls. Like nobody wants that, that, like singing about high school. Like that, yeah. like nobody wants to hear that shit. Like yeah. they want to hear your like, audience grows with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what we like. I forgot who told me, but it's held true for at least a decade now. It's never underestimate your audience. Never think that you need to dumb anything down. To make them like it make it as complex as you want to make it make it as personal as you want to make it because it's going to relate to them especially if you're writing what in our genre it's very much just like observational narrative you know i'm, I'm seeing something something's happening to me and then i'm writing about it yeah and when you're writing about it you think you're the only person going through that thing but then when you release this song you start getting the messages of like no that happened to me too that happened to me that happened to me this song helped me get through that exact same thing and then you start becoming a little bit more confident in the fact that like, okay, no matter where I'm at, there's going to be people that get it and they're going to follow along. And if not, we offer up songs every night. Like if you don't get the new record, great. Like that's only four of the songs on the set list. Everything else is before this. And if you liked everything before this, you're still going to love the live show. I tell Uh, you with the new one in particular, you talk about loss. Um, When when did you uh, lose your mother and your grandmother? Was during the pandemic? Yeah, I lost my uh, right before the pandemic. They both had uh, the uh, the they got out before the, they knew something was coming. <laughs> they got out in late nineteen. Yeah, lost my grandmother in October of nineteen, and then I lost my mother in uh, New Year's Eve of nineteen. Oh, man. So uh, within like three months, like the two women in my life, uh, I lost them, and 
And then obviously 2020 happens yeah. and three months into 2020, the whole world shuts down. And, mm -hmm. uh, it was hard, but again, it's, you know, I think a lot of writers would turn away from that kind of stuff, not be ready to write about it, not want to write about it. But if I've, like I said, if I've learned anything, it's to stare down the stuff that's eating at me and write about it because it, when you sing songs about it and you give it a name and you talk about it every night and you, you remove the stigma, like it, it takes away the power that stuff has over you. And it's, it's how I got through sobriety. It's, it's, it's how I deal with any problem I've ever had is I just write songs about it and sing it every night. And it becomes, it, it doesn't have a, like a hold on me anymore. Cause like when you, when you internalize it and think that you're the only people going through these things, that's where it starts eating away at you. But when you open it up to the world and just be like, this is what's going on. This is my problem. Like somebody talked to me about it. You'll always have people talking to you about it. And I think that's once you take away that power from the problem, like you can, you can really get through anything. And the sense of community that this band <clears throat> has fostered has been my saving grace, you know, knowing that every single town I go to, there's going to be a couple hundred kids showing up, singing words at the top of their lungs. Like, that gets me up yeah. every morning. Maybe some old men, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I say kids, that's the universal, I got, that's the crowd. I got three years on you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's reassuring, you know, because, you know, sometimes the world feels really lonely. Sometimes the world, you feel like you're the only person in it going through or getting a bad shake. And, uh, and I think shows are, are an example of, you know, the punk kids, the frat boys, uh, you know, the rednecks, uh, the, you know, 50-year-old dads, the 20-year-old college kids, you know, coming to the shows. And for 90 minutes, we're all part of the same thing. We're all part of this ride together. And that's really fun. Like the the, the sense of community that shows bring is, is the coolest thing in the world. It's a beautiful thing. And um sorely missed during the pandemic yeah without a doubt i remember the first show that i went to after you know things opened up again and it was just it felt like home yeah you know it felt like home but you you were talking about you know just writing from your authentic experiences and you know something that like i lost my father the week before the pandemic was a national emergency in 2020 Ugh. so i immediately connected with this record um starting right off with the first song uh just about loss and struggling with you know um with faith and your maker so to speak you know yeah. and then you know anger and and also sadness and all these emotions you know and i think for me i this record came along at the perfect time because if it would have happened immediately after i lost my father i wouldn't have been ready you know um because i was still dealing with all this this raw stuff yeah now a couple years later still hurts i still grieve but i don't know it just kind of feels um it's nice that one of my favorite musicians is writing this very personal thing for himself but it's also something that's personal for me it for feels sure. it feels less alone that's you know? that, that's the most rewarding part of being a songwriter is writing the songs because you have to because it's how you're dealing with the problem but also realizing that you're writing a soundtrack to someone else being able to deal with the same problem. You're putting words to someone else's problem when they might not be able to put the words to it. Yeah. And that's when you sit back and, you know, cause you know, I run the social media. I get the messages every day. Like this song saved me. This song got me sober. This song made me reconnect with my parents. This song, I, that's the kind of stuff that it's not just like, Hey, cool song, bro. Me and my friends like got yeah. drunk to this song this weekend. <laughs> Rad song, dude. It's like this song made me cry. It's like this song I was like, thinking about. This song touched me. I, this song lost, changed me. Yeah. This song made me feel something that maybe I didn't want to feel yet, <clears throat> but I needed to feel. And that's, you know, as a songwriter, that's when you start feeling like, you know, you're one of the Avengers. You're just like, oh, shit. Yeah, dude. Like, this is my superpower. This is rad. Um, it really is. It really yeah. is a superpower. I mean, yeah. Because you're writing from your own personal experiences, but you're touching all these other people, and everybody was affected by the pandemic. 100%. So, I, I talk about that every you know, night. I'm like, this is a record about loss. This is a record about the pandemic. And I was like, if you went, if you made it from 2020 to 2022 and didn't lose anything, I was like, you were a, a damn unicorn. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I would wrap myself yeah. in bubble wrap and never leave the house. I'm like, because your day is coming, friend. Yeah. I was like, if you dodged all those bullets, I was like, you're uh, you're in for something. No, but I, I, I am very sorry for the loss of your mother and your grandmother. But, um, you know, as you know, you're doing 
amazing work for so many other people, you know, just by writing about that. So thank Thanks, you. Thank, thank you for that. Appreciate that. And yeah. sorry to, sorry to hear about your dad. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. It's, you know, it's, it's getting older, right? Yeah. It's a little it's less life. tough though, knowing that other people are going, everybody has to go through it. You know, knowing that you're not the only person that has to, you know, like I, I consider myself lucky. Cause like, you know, I got to spend 38 years with my mom. Like my wife lost her mom when she was like four or five. Yeah. Um, I can, you know, and, and there's some people my age who's going to have their parents for another 20 years, you know, and so I, I can I can sit around and bitch about it, but I also have to think like there's some people that may, you know, may have never met their parents. That's how I feel exactly. You know, I, earlier, I, I, or I had only had a couple years with them. Yeah. yeah, you know, I was like being grateful for that time. My mom got to watch me grow up. My mom watched me succeed. My mom watched me start a family. My mom got to meet Pearl, my daughter. Um, it's special. Like that's huge because like I look at my brother. Who's only fifteen months younger than me? My mom was not at his wedding. She died oh, man. like a couple months before his wedding. My mom was not at. My mom never met her grandson. His my, my nephew. Um, so like, anytime I go to bitch about something, I realize that there's somebody. And, and my brother, fifteen months younger than me. Yeah. My brother, I had so much more than he did, and it was. And we're only separated by a year and a half. You know, it's like. It's it's crazy how that works. You need a little bit of time. At least I did. I needed a little bit of time between the actual passing of my father uh, to act, to be able to accept that. Yeah, and, and and make that the silver lining. I think you know, like my dad was able to see me buy a home. He was able to see me succeed in my field. And uh, you know, but my, a regret that I have is we don't have a child yet. So yeah. I'll never beat my child. So much like your brother, you know, there's you have to look at the positives though. I think yeah, you have to. That's what I look at. Like like my mom. Like if my mom had died ten years early, she would have seen me like failing. Yeah, she'd have seen me like uh, I was an addict. I was touring the country, making no money, just like failing. Like in her in her opinion, I was failing. But when she passed, you know, I owned a home. I was married. I had a kid. Like she did her job. Like she raised a functioning member of society. Yeah. Um, she was like, I, I try to think like if she'd have passed ten years earlier, she would have died thinking her son was you know like that she failed me but like she made it long enough to see both of her kids fully unattached from them surviving and succeed not just surviving but thriving yeah and i think you know that's that's something i've always talked to my brother about is like we have to be thankful that they lived long enough to see us you know break away from the nest and build our own nest and 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 be fully self-sufficient and something you can hang your hat on uh, and, that's, and something that, yeah that's something like we're me and my brother are extremely proud of because we've got friends who still leech <clears throat> off of their parents um but that's something not only that we can be proud of but i think my parents can be proud of because like they can sit back and say we raised our kids to value you know independence and value hard work and value and i think my, it took my dad a long time to realize that like that was instilled in me. I just applied it in a very non-traditional way. Yeah. Like my dad gave me the same work ethic he gave my brother and that he had. I just I applied that work ethic in a very, very non-traditional way. <laughs> but like looking back now, he can kind of see like, holy shit, like the things I talked about, like wanting something and working for it and go and get it, it stuck. He just applied it in a very, a way that I don't understand. Yeah. My dad doesn't understand still to this day that like I make a, I make a living off of like writing songs yeah. blows his mind <laughs> you know, like that people like pay money to yeah, like hear really. the shit i make up on my living room couch he's just like i don't get it like, he's like so you don't even go into like work i was like no i was like when i'm not touring i'm just i'm at home with pearl like hanging out being a dad he's like how do you make money i was like well people buy the music <laughs> like every day they continuously like buy every the music, day they're yeah. buying music and yeah. listening to the music and buying a shirt and you know coming to shows and i was like <clears throat> That's how I make a living. Yeah. And he's like, I, I, I don't understand. I don't like it. it, it does, he doesn't understand it, but uh, he thinks it's cool now because <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. like, oh wow, like, yeah. you're like, like independent. Like you don't need anything. And I was like, yeah. I was like, music's doing great, Dad. I promise. Yeah. Like, I think music's gonna be. I think I don't think I'm gonna have to work a job <laughs> I think I got ever it. again. <laughs> no. At what, at what point? Not necessarily whenever you were able to, you know, not have to have another job. That aside what point in your career do you feel like it was that I made it moment? Um, 
Was there a was was there a, a certain period or like a this is it kind of thing? So the last time I had a job was 2007. Mm-hmm. So I haven't had a job in a very long time. Um, but that's on purpose. Like I quit my job because that was the I didn't need any kind of like uh, safety net. Yeah, I needed to cut the bungee cord. It really and should just, push yourself and just jump yeah. off the side of the cliff and be yeah. like, I'm either gonna fly or I'm gonna fail miserably. Yeah. Um. So 2007 was the last time like, I was like, I've got to figure out how to make a living playing music. And uh, I went out and, and failed a lot. A lot of months where I don't, you know, I promise I'm going to get this paid. You know, keep the phone, <laughs> please keep my phone on one more month. I promise I'll get it paid. Yeah, we've all been there. Um, but then I think 2012 was a real turning moment because it was the first time people actually started liking a record we put out. Like on a grand scale. Like, right magazines were writing about it and blogs were writing about it and it was making a bunch of like the year end like best of list and that was the first time we were like oh people are like paying attention to it but i think wolves might have been the first time where we all were like we might not ever have to like work real jobs again yeah like we might be able to play music for the rest of our life like this is wild like not only were shows selling out but like shows were selling out in like big rooms like I always tell people, I'm like, if you can play in front of 200 people every single night at a $20 cover, you never have to work a job again. That's four grand a night you're getting paid. Yeah. Like, that adds up. And over the course of a week or a month tour, if you can play in front of 200 people at 20 bucks a night, you never have to work again. But we were starting to play in front of like a thousand people a night at a $20 ticket. We're like, fuck, this is, this is ungodly. Like, well, like, 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 we don't, like, we might not have to play 300 shows a year anymore. <laughs> we might be able to cut this back yeah. and, and still make a living. Um, and, you know, I think that was probably 2014, 2015 is where we sat back. And at the end of a tour, it wasn't like, oh, God, what bills am I going to pay? It was at the end of the tour. It was like, okay, well, all the bills for this month were already paid last month. So I guess maybe I'll go on a trip. Maybe I'll buy my girlfriend something nice. Yeah, You know, maybe I'll start – putting money aside for a house like that's where your the mentality starts changing where it's like you know like trying just to just to survive and then getting to this comfort level of like holy shit like i might be able to live like a normal life that had to be huge oh uh, yeah it was like probably blew your dad's mind didn't it yeah <laughs> like oh trust me yeah. like my dad my dad probably thought i'd like joined a a crime syndicate when i when i told him <laughs> i bought a house um but yeah, it's it's something you don't think of when you're living on on people's floors when you start a band and you're eating fast food every day and you're wondering how you're going to get to the next town. The last thing on your mind is like financial stability. Sure. You know, the only thing on your mind is okay, I'm in Columbus today. I got to be in Cleveland tomorrow. We need $40 in gas and a place to stay. How are we going to make that $40 in gas and a place to stay? And then going and playing a show and doing it and trying to like knowing that's the the bare minimum we need to survive. Anything else is just, you know, an extra thing of chicken nuggets we're all going to split, you know. <laughs> and it's like go and but like loving doing what you're doing enough to suffer for it. Yeah. Like it was is incredible. Like I don't like. I'm so glad. Sixteen years in that, looking back, this band made it the way we made it, because we had to take every single step of the ladder. We had to start on the very, very bottom ground floor and start up the ladder. And literally we had to, we didn't get to skip rungs. Some people are lucky and the label just flies them in on a helicopter and drops them off halfway up the ladder. And that's where they start from. And you're just like, shit, like they don't understand what it's like to, to do all the work below there. But I think that's one of the, my favorite things about where we're at is like, we're already so high on the ladder. Like we always joke. It's like, I'd say less than 1% of people that pick up a guitar and start writing songs will ever get to where we're at right now. But like, I still look down and realize how far we've come. Like there's still a lot to go. Like I, I still got a lot of ladder to climb, but every now and then you have to take that moment to look back down the ladder and realize how far you've came. You think you would have had that appreciation had that helicopter zero. taken you up? No, to, absolutely not. Yeah. Cause I watch struggle, right? I watch my friends, who didn't have to do that. I watched my friends who came in and started, 
you know, the kids that, you know, were born on third base thinking they hit a triple, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, like those kind of kids. And, and, and I'm not knocking them because like, if I, if somebody had offered me that safety net, you don't turn it down. I wouldn't have turned it down. Yeah. Like when I was getting started, if some major label was like, we're going to make you huge immediately, I wouldn't have said no. Um, but because I didn't get offered that, I had to learn how to do stuff. I had to learn how to put my own music out. I had to learn. But then fast forward 16 years, and those friends that started Halfway Up the Ladder don't own any of their music. Never will. They can't make yeah, money off their that's art. That's wild. And then I look at me 16 years in. We got 16 records. I own 100% of those records. I own, I've, I've, I've wrote every single song for this band. Every song I own 100% of. So it's like my publishing pays me every month. The royalties for 16 records come in every month. It's like it finally gets to a point where it's like I'm really thankful that nobody offered me a shortcut. Because you would have taken it at the time. Because I would have taken yeah. it, and I would have had to give something up to take it. No shortcut's free. Every shortcut, they're taking something from you, whether it's a piece of your publishing, a point on your record. The word perpetuity gets thrown around in a contract, and I'm watching kids sign away six records just so they can be on Warner Brothers. Yeah. And it's like you realize that like you never get that back for what a fifty thousand dollar advance, a hundred thousand dollar advance. Like, that's not life changing money. Like that's year changing money. Yeah, but if you're, you're gonna have but a, if you're young, you're gonna have a a rad year. Yeah, and then you're gonna be like, man, they own six. And when you're that young, that's like your most creative time. That's when your flow state is just constant. You're constantly creating. You're constantly being inspired. You're constantly learning. You're constantly growing. And some corporation's going to own six records during your most fruitful period for a hundred grand. It's, it's like, get out of here. Like, it's a scam. But I would have t- taken it. If somebody had offered sure. me that at 21, I would have sure. signed my name in blood. <laughs> like, I would have been like, cool, take everything. Like, I just, I want to, I want to, I don't want to sleep on floors anymore. Yeah. But because nobody offered that safety net, I had to figure out, I had to game plan, like how I'm going to take this next step on the ladder. And once I get there, enjoy that moment for a, a little bit and then start game planning. How am I going to take that next step? And taking every single step. Yeah, it took 16 years to get to a point where I think a lot of people still ask like, so like, do you wish you were more successful? You know, I get that ask a lot. It's like, what? It's a, it's I was a like, weird question. I was like, compared to what? <laughs> compared to what? Yeah. I was like, you know, we're not Jason Isbell big. We're not Brandy Carlisle big. I was like, but we're also bigger than a lot of bands that I love that I think are great yeah. bands. And I was like, we're in this really, like we all make a living. You're playing. headlining nice size venues across the country. Yeah. Regularly. Like, 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 like rad venues. Like this summer we played 41 states, thousand cap rooms in every yeah. one of them. And we're doing pretty good in those thousand cap rooms. It's pretty successful if I do say so. I was like, and I'll always love those, those questions. Like, so like, why aren't y'all like, like, Headline and amphitheaters. I'm like, well, that's many more <laughs> steps up the ladder. I was like, I'm just kind of focused on which one I'm at now. But uh, they probably think that they're paying a compliment. Yeah, I think you I, should be. Play- I think in their so. mind, maybe in yeah. their head, it's one of those. It's, it comes it's out nicer than it does. But like yeah. in my head, I'm like, like shit. I'm like, if you knew how much work it took to get here, <laughs> like you wouldn't be saying that. But yeah, it's I'm I'm appreciative of the hard work. Again, going back, I wouldn't take the easy way even if i was offered it knowing what i know now but i didn't know what i know now then so yeah. it's if somebody had offered me a shortcut like and i'm watching to this day you know 2022 when we, there's so much knowledge about how fucked up the music industry is and i'm still watching friends take the bullshit deal take the the, the it, what in the long run turns out to be a very small amount of money up front mm-hmm. for your art um because you don't know how to do it yourself or you don't want to put in the work that it takes to build it yourself. Ben tried to get me to sign away all of my rights to do this show. <laughs> I said, no, sir. <laughs> I know what I have. I know my worth. Um, I want to go back just a, a moment. And, um, you know, if you're comfortable talking about it, you talked about some of your struggles with, with addiction yeah. and sobriety, sobriety. Um, I mean, obviously that's something that for me, listening to your music, I feel like had an effect on your music over the years. Is this something that you kind of wrote about and talked a little bit about some of those experiences? Um, you know, it, do you continue to to pull from that? And 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 also, how how did that affect the ultimate departure of the other members in 2017? You were sober at that point, I believe. Yeah. Right. So was that still like a lingering factor with some of the 
the prior relationship problems? So my last drink was August 31st, 2014. Um, okay. A little over eight years ago. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, and, and what I try to tell people, they're like, well, when your band quit, you were sober. I'm like, yeah, they got to see three years of sobriety. They also had to see seven years of drunk me. Uh, I was, I, again, I'll be the first one to admit it. I was a terrible friend. I was a terrible boss. Um, any bad thing that happened, I never took ownership of. Always projected it onto someone else. Always blamed someone else for any shortcomings I had. There's no way it could be my fault because I was a drunk asshole last night. It had to have been somebody else's fault. There's no way these relationships and these bridges that are being burned were my fault. Got to be somebody else's fault. And so, yeah, the band got to see me for three years working, growing, trying to be a better person. And it took a while. Like, at the beginning of sobriety, I was still, in their eyes, that guy. And some of those guys, I'm still that guy. You know, fast forward five years after they quit, they'll never see me as like a, like a lot of people like now, you know, really respect where I'm at in my recovery. Um, being able to talk about the things I talk about, the really dark parts of my past that I that I don't run from, I embrace them. I put them out in front before I talk about any of the good stuff in my life. Like most people know all the bad stuff before they know any of the good stuff. Um, they'll never see that guy. They'll always see me as like the asshole boss or the egotistical front man. They'll always see that guy, and I get that. And I, and I've tr- I've tried. Like luckily, you know, we have a mutual friend in Bill Corbin. Um, me and Bill didn't talk for three years. We didn't follow each other on social media. And then out of the blue one day, we reconnected. And it was like we didn't miss a beat. It's awesome. It went right back to like friends. Yeah. And now every time I play in Fort Worth, he comes out and sees me. If he's home, I try my best to see him in Raleigh. Um, those are friendships like that I truly treasure. Like, especially like somebody like Bill who like I went through the trenches with that guy. Yeah. Like we saw the absolute best and worst of humanity together. Um, and so like when you lose a friend like that for three years, you're just like, oh, those aren't the prices you want to pay for success. Those are, you're just like, oh, I miss that. But then when they come back into your life and you get to kind of show them that like you're a different person or you're a better person or you've grown or you're not the asshole that was the reason they quit in the first place. Um, that's rewarding. That's a really rewarding feeling. Like, I've, I feel like those reconnections, those rekindlings of relationships are what I live for these days. Like I love being able to meet up with somebody for coffee and reconnect and apologize for anything that I did that made the friendship suffer. Like completely taking full ownership, which is something I refused to do back in the day when I was an addict. I refused to take any ownership of any problem. Um, so I think it's important. That's one of the huge things in recovery is, is owning the mistakes and not being ashamed of them, but almost wearing them as like a badge of honor. It's like, yeah, I, these are all the pitfalls that I fell into, but look at me now. Like I'm still here. I'm, I survived those things. Um, sobriety changed my life. Sobriety is, I talk about it every night at shows. Recovery is a beautiful thing. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life, but it's also the most rewarding thing i've ever done in my life which is a direct correlation to anything hard i've ever done it usually tends to music is the hardest thing i've ever done it's also the most rewarding thing i've ever done um same with recovery um i'm still an addict i'm still an alcoholic um i'm just an addict that hasn't drank today hasn't drank in eight years i'm a alcoholic that hasn't drank in eight years um i still want to i still have that desire to just don't um, and that's what a lot of people think. They're like, oh, you're like cured. I'm like, I'm never cured. I was like, there's moments where every ounce of me wants to go to the bar and order a shot right now. Right. But I don't because I know how much good has come into my life since I stopped drinking. I'm like, I tell myself, and I know it's a lie, kind of, but I tell myself every time I want a drink, I'm like, if you have one drink, you go back to 2014. You go back to that life, that guy who didn't have a wife, didn't have a kid, didn't have a house, didn't have the respect of his colleagues, didn't have the respect of his family, didn't have the respect of his friends. 
One drink puts you back there, and that's all I need to be like, you know what? I'm going to have a, a LaCroix. Yeah. Uh, do you have any Pumpla Moose? Uh, <laughs> I would love a grapefruit sparkling bubbly water right now. I was going to ask you if you're yeah. going to flavor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a LaCroix Pumpla Moose guy. Uh, yeah. I love the Topo Chico. Uh, lime is my flavor in that. Uh, yeah. I love any of the right the my, my kid calls them spicy waters. That's funny. Uh, I love any of the spicy waters. Uh, <laughs> uh, my daughter thinks that's what soda is. My daughter's never had like a Coca Cola or Smart. a Sprite that's, that's, or anything. My, my my daughter thinks soda is uh, soda water. That's awesome. Um, so we go out and she's like, "I want a soda." And I was like, "She wants a like a tonic water. Is what she wants." <laughs> like, do you have a bubble? So I was like, "Don't ruin this." For I was me. like, "Do you have a bubble water?" <laughs> Because like, the minute she drinks like an orange, like a Fanta or something, she's gonna be like, "What have you been hiding from me? <laughs> it's over. This is candy. This is liquid candy." But like my my daughter drinks uh, sparkling water and cold brew. She loves like black awesome. black cold brew. I've got pictures of her from like when she was like three months old, walking around with like a tiny little cold brew, just like <laughs> just like a like a little drunk caffeinated kid. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, it's it, you know nothing's worth throwing away uh my recovery for um and i'm lucky because everybody in my band drinks um you know there's booze right now there's booze on the bus you know there's i walk by it every day just i don't have any desire for it it takes an incredible strength yeah it, it's, i mean it really does it's also just a realization of like what i can lose yeah what's at stake and my family, my friendships, new ones and repaired ones, are worth far more than a couple hours of fun, socializing. So, uh, which would you consider to be the the more important uh, factor? Would it be the discipline or the motivation in not having that drink? I think the discipline comes with the motivation. Yeah, I think I I don't consider myself a disciplined person at all consider myself a highly motivated person mm -hmm. but i think with that motivation you look up and you're eight years into it like there's some discipline that came from that um it's sure. it's it's always going to be motivated i'm always motivated not to drink but in turn not by not drinking shows the discipline um so i think they, got, they those two things kind of go hand in hand for me because you know i'm in a one, I'm in a genre of music that fully embraces, almost encourages drinking. You know, country music is always associated with whiskey and your wife leaving and your dog dying, somebody stealing your truck and drowning yourself in a bottle for the night. Uh, and I've written plenty of those songs. Um, I also am in the live music business, which is centered around selling alcohol to people. They buy a $20 ticket so they can go in and spend $40 at the bar. Um, <laughs> and then my job is to play to them. Yeah. Um, so, so much of my life revolves around alcohol. It's, that's what makes it hard. Like if I worked like a desk job from home and could just get the alcohol out of the house and never have to be tempted by it, like that's still hard. Anybody, I'll never take anything away from anybody that makes it a whole day without drinking and then does the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day. I'll never take anything away from that because that is, that is so powerful. But I think the reason people look at me as an influence or as a uh, a role model, big quotation marks <laughs> around that word, is that not only do I do it every day, I do it every day surrounded by the thing that I'm running from. Um, and that's what I tell people every night. I'm like, I am living, I am a walking testament. Like that if you want to get rid of this stuff, you can, I promise. Um, if I can do it and still do what I do, still stand up in front of people and emote and share and not be drunk and put on the same show, yeah, a better show than I was putting on when I was drunk because I'm in control. Like a really good drunk show, we called it like, you know, it was the perfect mix. It was like walking that line of like too drunk and just drunk enough to where you were loose, you were spontaneous. You were chatting the crowd up, but you weren't slurring your words. You weren't falling down. You weren't missing parts. Um, yeah, like you hear people say, like, oh, like, loosen up, you take a shot or two. Right? Yeah. You're in that zone kind of thing. But once you learn how to yeah. do that sober, talk about feeling like a superpower. Once you can get in front of a crowd of thousands of people and command them, like just hold them on every single word, sober, 
there's no going back. That's the feeling. That's that's the feeling is because the next morning you're not like, well, what was that one thing I said that everybody laughed at? Like it was kind of funny. You wake up the next morning, you're like, I owned that crowd last night. Yeah. Like for an hour and a half, I held their neck, and then when I let go, they got to let go. Like that's oh, that's why we do it. Um, and I tell people every night, I'm like, if I can do this in my line of work, I promise you, you can do it in your line of work. It just takes wanting it. It takes, cause like my family wanted me to get sober long before I got sober. My wife wanted me to get sober long before I got sober. It wasn't until I wanted to get sober. It wasn't until I was the one that said, you know what? I've got a problem. I got to fix this. If I don't fix this, I'm going to lose everything I have. Cause she wasn't my wife. Then she's my girlfriend. I was like, if I don't fix this, I'm going to lose her. So you guys were together through the, the tough times. Yeah, yeah, I've been dating. My, me and my wife have been together since 2011. That's awesome. So she had to see three years of me being a, an absolute, utter asshole. Um, but she stuck with me. She saw something in me. I have no idea. And I still, to this day, I, like my wife is not just physically, but every aspect um, out of my league in every single, <laughs> every single way. Um, and she saw something in me. Um, and still sees it, still sees the, and hopefully I'm becoming a little bit more of the, uh, the person that she saw, um, me being, but like 99% of any sane human being would have ran for the Hills in 2014, but I got sober and it took a lot of time to build back to where we are now. But, you know, me and my wife are in a really great place. We have an amazing kid together. Life is comfortable. Um, you know, she's a stay-at-home mom. I only have to go out for about 75 shows a year. Like, we got a really great thing. And, you know, she saw, she saw all of that in me. I just had to find it for myself. Yeah. And once I saw what she saw, it kind of became unstoppable. Once I saw the per- – once I started becoming the person that she saw from the jump, that was, that was when everything started clicking. That's amazing. Because she was always yeah. like – I, I never li- I never cared that you were in a band. I never cared that you write songs. Like she doesn't like the band. Like she doesn't like our music. <laughs> like she's like the thing that I love about you. She's like is how motivated you are. She's like nothing stops you. She's like when you put your mind to something, like ninety nine people will tell you no, and you know that the next person is going to tell you yes. It's a humbling thing to have somebody have that type of belief in you. Yeah, it's it it, really it, is. yeah, it, it, and it's one of those things that when you continuously let them down, you, you, you start being like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. And then they stick with you after constantly letting them down. You're just like, well, fuck, maybe they're right. Maybe I should give what they see a try. And then you start doing it. And all of a sudden my wife likes to take a lot of credit. And she, I told you, like <laughs> I saw this guy a long time ago. I was like, you should be like an NBA scout or something. Because like, if you can see that from that far away, cause she found an absolute wreck of a human being and, and you know, it's amazing what a nice shirt and a good haircut will do to you. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I thank you so much for uh, being open and being willing to talk about this. Uh, yeah, it's my story. It's it, you know, it's, it's you know, I'm it, very open about. I it. I think it helps a lot of people too. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, you know feeling less alone whenever you're dealing with loss and things like that. And I think you know you are uh, uh, somebody that people look up to as some, uh, an example of how you can do this, especially in your world. Yeah. You know, and so uh, I just want to thank you for sharing that, man. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for pulling it out of me. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, we're uh, going to wrap up here in a minute, but um, I uh, want to do something fun real quick. I like to ask people what their Mount Rushmore of musical heroes are. So I want to know what your Mount Rushmore of musical heroes are and maybe throw a couple artists that people wouldn't expect you to be into as well um, after the fact. So we'll do the four that are, that are huge and then a couple. I don't like the term guilty pleasure because I think anybody that puts the music out there uh, is deserving yeah, I, of fandom. I, I think but. as far as me, me as a writer, yeah. there's there's the head, the big, whoever the biggest head that we could put on there, the, the main inspiration is Bruce Springsteen. My man. Um, I would not be writing songs if it wasn't for the music of Bruce Springsteen. He taught me everything I know about narrative songwriting. He taught me everything I know about telling a story in three minutes. A believable story. Um, Have you ever met Bruce? Never met Bruce. Yeah. I don't know. I I would lose my. Sh- I, I would. I, I don't fangirl often. There's there's only a few people I fangirled over. Um, but I've never met Bruce, and I oh, yeah. 
I like to tell myself I wouldn't fangirl, but I, I more than likely would be like, oh my God, like, you're like my favorite person ever and like everything. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so funny you say that because anybody listening to this that knows me, Ben's over there smiling. He, I'm from Jersey originally. Yeah. He is probably the only person that would make me really fangirl too. Cause yeah. I've worked in radio for so long. You know what I mean? I get yeah, me, I, so in this business. People, I've, you know? I'm lucky to call some of the greatest songwriters yeah. of all time. Friends, you know, Bruce is a hero and it's Bruce is a, Bruce is like, Bruce transcended being just a songwriter a long time ago. Bruce, like the boss. When you start getting nicknames, yeah, like that's when you're in a different category. But like the boss, because you can say the boss and people know exactly who you're fucking talking about. Um, the boss is that's that's the American dream. That's the American story right there. That's the guy who you know you pull yourself up from the bootstraps and you you know you 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 work hard and you you, you perfect your craft and you take over the world with it. And you become this like shining light and this inspiration. Like that dude, that dude is that's it for me. Um, I wear it on my sleeve. Like there's a reason I have a really big, like anthemic rock and roll band, and yeah. it's because of Bruce Springsteen. I got to tell you, I I did not know that he was somebody that was an inspiration to you like that. Massive. And it's funny. I have my notes here, and I wanted to make sure to fit this in. This is the highest compliment I can give a musician in my mind. Yeah, and you'll appreciate it. I think over the years, and especially on this new album. It is a very Springsteen-esque uh, storytelling uh, quality that you have. I mean, it, it reminds me so much of his ability to tell a story and to really grab the listener and make them be a part of it. And I, I got that so much from that, and now I know why. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Man. Yeah, uh, we've been getting that a lot the last couple records. Yeah. It's more, and they're always like, "I don't want to like offend you, but like, it's very Springsteen-y. I was like, "That's ben, never." Like, I was like, "That's never going to offend that's me." A I like, that's I like, a compliment. I was like, "I promise you that." that uh, yeah, there was some magazine called me like, uh, "Like this is what Bruce Springsteen would sound like if he was born in North Carolina," and I was like, "I will that, put that on my <laughs> gravestone." It's amazing. I was like, "I was like, carve that in marble right now, <laughs> and just go ahead and set it up for that's, me." That's amazing. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's the if that's the worst thing that ever gets said about me, fantastic. Um, All right, so we got the boss. Springsteen's up there. Um, Craig Finn from the Whole Steady is up there as far as yeah. One of the reasons I started a band. Um, I was a big Lifter Puller fan, uh, huge, huge Hold Steady fan. Um, Separation Sunday was you know Hold Steady, Hold Steady almost killed me, and um, Separation Sunday are the two records that really stood out. And then when Boys and Girls in America came out, it was just gangbusters from there because yeah. it became like you know again and it's and it's all a direct lineage of bruce like i call it the church of springsteen it's the church of springsteen it. it's like the you know the 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 two degrees of separation because you know when franz comes in with that really twinkly piano stuff that's just that's springsteen and then you've got this literary storyteller mm -hmm. coming out and talking you through these very vivid scenes have you heard their cover of atlantic city oh it's, it's ma beautiful. Uh, man it's gorgeous anyway. and uh craig's uh, me and Craig have become like uh, internet buddies. Like, That's cool. Uh, we follow each other on the internet. We like each other's like <laughs> posts and and stories and stuff. And it's we, good to have that support. We, we yeah, send nice. some you yeah. know some fire emojis here and there. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's up there for me. Like everything, his new solo record is just as good yeah. as any of his earlier work. Yeah. That's you know when you can when you can start spanning decades and still putting out meaningful work. Um, that's when you that's what that that's legendary to me i would agree um, for sure uh so craig finn bruce springsteen um patterson hood from the drive by truckers um is up there for me um not because i don't think he was the best songwriter in the truckers i think isbel was the better songwriter um and i'm not going to put isbel in my mount rushmore just because isbel's a friend yeah and i'm not putting like close friends <laughs> yeah and and uh and the thing <laughs> But Patterson is the reason, um, one of the uh, one of the bands that made me want to start a band. Um, one of the reasons I I thought I could do it. Um, he told these really great songs about the South, and he told them in a way that was hyper progressive, but still not condescending to where he was from. Like it was this beautiful balance of pointing out the negative aspects of being from the south but also embracing all the beautiful parts about being from the south I, you know i think he calls it the the duality of the southern thing <laughs> um but I, I it was the first time i'd ever heard anybody that sounded like me like redneck 
but also like condemning all of the the bad history of the South, but also praising the good parts about being from the South, the music, the culture, uh, the food, but also being like, hey, we've got a lot of shit to to pay for. We've got a lot of shit to to admit finally that like there's a problem here. Um, I, it was huge. Um, very influential on my songwriting. Uh, the entire canon of Patterson's work. The Truckers was like those, uh, that Dirty South record changed my life. Um, um, yeah. The Truckers, Hold Steady, Springsteen. And the third band that made me, I mean, the fourth band that made me start music um, was Lucero. That Tennessee record changed my life. Yeah. Um, and again, luckily, you know, Ben Nichols is, is a friend. Uh, we just played the, the Memphis, uh, the family reunion, uh, in Memphis and, and Lucero's coming to play with us for our road trip to Raleigh this year. Oh, nice. Um, again, one of those bands that like started off, they were like heroes and now they're, you know, I'm almost positive. I'm Facebook friends with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, a great band, great songs. But like Tennessee, nobody's darling that much further west. That era, that got me through my twenties. And again, all of these people taught me that you didn't have to have a voice like Adele to tell a good story. You didn't have to be the most, the best traditional singer, as long as your voice was honest, as long as your voice was authentic, as long as what you were saying came from the root of who you were, as long as you believed every single word you were saying and conveyed it in a point, in a way that every single person that listened to you believed every single word you were saying. You could do this. Um, I got to say, like, I don't know that anybody that I would really consider myself to be a big fan of has a traditionally, you know, like... Same, uh, same. Like, you know, proper... I don't know, you know too many people that are like, voice. you know, sound like Sam Smith and write really great yeah, songs. Yeah, like all, uh, all the bands you just named and, you know, then like... Talking like you know, like Brian Fallon from Gaslight Anthem has got that gravelly, gruff. You know, like yeah, those, I, those, I like that kind of stuff. Those voices, I feel like they've earned those voices. Yeah, hard earned those voices from years of, you know, drinking and smoking and 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 screaming in punk rock clubs. I heard a a, a, like, a quote one time. I can't. I think it was Brian Fallon that actually said it about Lucero. Somebody says, "How do I how do I get my band to sound like Lucero?" And it's like, you know playing smoky clubs and listen to, to Hank, you know yeah. what I mean? All your life. And then that kind of, kind of evolves into that. Like you earn it. it yeah. You got to earn it. Like your, your voice doesn't get ripped apart by sitting in your living room, humming along to the radio. Your voice gets ripped apart by going out on the road, living hard and screaming until it gives out, going to bed, waking up, doing it again the next night and then going to bed and doing yeah. it the next night. And your voice, you shred it. Yeah. But something about years of shredding your voice when people hear it, 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 it's lived in. It's honest. It's like a old pair of boots. Like it, it, you know, it's. It might not be the most, the best thing to look at, but it's like <laughs> it's it's comfortable. It's it's inviting. Um, and I think that's where all those guys' voices sit for me, and it's where my voice, I think, is um, for a lot of people. Because um, I'm not gonna, I'm not going on American Idol and winning any kind of singing competition. But as far as you know it's a very honest voice. Like, this is what I have and it's the best thing. I, and I do the best of what I got. Well, you nailed it when you said authentic, authentic. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not trying to be anybody else. And like the thing about all those, those four people I listed, the minute they open their mouth, I can tell you it's them. The minute a song starts and they start singing, I can tell you if it's Bruce or if it's Ben Nichols or if it's Craig Finn or if it's Patterson hood immediately. And that's, there's something to be said about that. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, it's a hell of a list, man. That's a that's a great list. Yeah, and that's and like again, that's you know probably not my best songwriter list. Probably not my best all time. Like, but those are the four most influential. Like, they, this band would not exist without those four bands. There you go. And they came. They popped in your mind for a reason. Yeah. What are what are like one or two that people wouldn't expect you to be into? Kind of some of your fans would be surprised to find out that you that you. Not necessarily inspirational, but just like you know. You I don't know. I listen. I listen to a lot of the stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff in our genre. Yeah. Um, whether I, I like to call it like punk rock kids who play country music. Um, 
So I listen to a lot of, you know, I'm a huge Brian Fallon fan. I'm a yeah. huge, um, basically anybody that used to front a hardcore band that now plays an acoustic <laughs> guitar. Right. I tend to lean, I gravitate toward yeah. that. Joe I, I relate, yeah, I, re I, yeah, yeah. I relate to all that stuff. Yeah. Um, in my early twenties, I went through a huge, and I still go through it. I still love it. Like a really, uh, like a hip hop phase, um, all through high school, all through college. Um, cause when I was in college, early aughts, oh two, oh three, oh four, um, the backpack hip hop thing was kind of taking form. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had an account on okay player. Um, <laughs> you know, I checked in on that stuff, like the black star record, uh, Talib Kweli and yeah. most Def changed my life. Like it's, it's an incredible record and it turned me on to so much other stuff. And in Raleigh at the time we had a really great rock scene, but you know, there's this, there's this group called little brother coming up and it was ninth wonder and fonte uh big poo um they were kind of this like underground hip-hop thing like i guess ninth wonder got a lot of recognition because he did a bunch of beats on the mary j blige record the beyonce record jay-z's black album um but they were like in raleigh and like yeah. i was working at a record store and they would come in and you know ninth would just sit there and flip through the dollar bin <laughs> and buy records and, and you know he just went back home just to try to listen for samples sure um that's pretty cool so I, I got really into that stuff because the guy i was working with was really into it and uh you know uh i guess that first kanye record came out and you know college drop i still have my college dropout t-shirt yeah uh you know <laughs> I, still, still, I still love that album uh, you know not that, the biggest fan of kanye the person sometimes. kanye has <laughs> kanye has evolved into something different than the kanye yeah, but, but those first man, two records those stuff, first yeah. two or three records uh uh twisted fantasy is still one of the it's it's genius it's brilliant um, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I listen to everything he puts out. Um, still to this day, um, it, like as far as art goes, like he has taken it to certain points where I can't follow. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't get that. Yeah, but some of that early stuff was like just really, really. I love anybody that has a story and anybody that has a unique way of telling said story. And I think hip hop, um, and I'll go down fighting for this one. Hip hop is the is the only genre of music that is consistently pushing the limitations of the english language um words that should not rhyme on paper rhyme in songs and as someone that loves words as someone that loves language i am always intrigued by people that can take language which is something that's very concrete and bend it and mold it into a way to fit any story they're telling like that i don't care if you're a folk singer if you're an mc uh if you're the front man for a big old rock and roll band if you have that kind of grasp on language i'm always in awe of that i'm yeah. fascinated by that it's a true art form so I, I would say that the thing that most people wouldn't know about me was was you know i, I was a hip-hop head that's pretty cool like for yeah. about 10 years I, that's yeah I was listening to a lot of Dylan and Springsteen, but I was also, you know, listening to a bunch of Tribe Called Quest <laughs> and and kind like of it. kind of soaking all that stuff in. But, I think it's uh, important to you know, like I've got my punk rock background and everything, yeah. but to have diversity in, in your musical taste and a well rounded catalog of music that you can get into. Uh, yeah, I got lucky. I was raised on country music. Yeah, that was my foundation. My dad listened to country music. My mom listened to soul music. Um, so we would be in the car and every time it depended on who we were in the car with, it was either the country station or the oldie station. So I got just as much Joe Diffie as I did Otis Redding. <laughs> you know, I got just as much Reba McIntyre as I did Aretha Franklin. Um, so I feel like that was a really good foundation for music. Uh, and then I got into like, like the punk rock metal scene for a while, uh, went to a, a huge hip hop stage somehow got pulled back into country but not like mainstream country like the kind of yeah. americana that is prevalent um today um i feel like my like I, we always joke my band is made up none of us listen to the same stuff <laughs> i feel like we would be like the ultimate like a uh, bar trivia group you guys would win gold every like time. us yeah. six going in because yeah. like when it comes to like singer songwriters i've got a pretty good 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 ear and then there's one of my guys, uh, my, my the guy who plays B3 uh, and piano in my band, huge funk and soul guy, uh, drummer, huge funk guy. Uh, 
it's 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 funny because you know we're just a bunch of you know six you know mediocre white dudes and i feel like we could go into a bar and, and kind of hold our own uh yeah. when it came to like useless uh music trivia i love it you know you say useless no, nah, not useless. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's stuff that we you, keep you, in the back of our head. If you can win a $50 gift certificate of bar trivia. True, yeah, that's, true. That's something. If I can win some deluxe loaded nachos <laughs> for, no, for knowing the alternate cover of a President's United States of America record. Uh, that's I've done, something. And, that's a and, skill. And I've done that before. We were we, 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 we did it once. We, we got to a venue earlier, and they had like trivia night before the show. And uh, You're sitting there cleaning up. And and we know we were sitting, we were all, it was like the five guys in the band were sitting there and we were playing trivia. And the final round was like uh, album cover, musical album covers. Yeah. And they'd give you the album cover and you had to write down the name of the band and the name of the record. And like I managed a record store for six years. And so it was, just, it wasn't fair. <laughs> and what the, and it was a tie between us and this other. And the, and the tiebreaker was an Australian deluxe edition of the president's the united states of america greatest hits the cover the cover and it wasn't available in the states but i had to order it for somebody i knew exactly what it was when it came up and i looked at the other team and i was like i'll let you guys go first <laughs> i was like do you know what that is and they didn't know and i looked at me i was like that's the i was like that's the australian uh deluxe edition of the president's the united states and and the guy looked at me like like, like I was like, right. I, 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 some pra- some practicing, I was just practicing dark arts in front of him. Uh, just bow down. Yeah. It was just like, point. wow. And I was like, guys, like we have a bar tab of $25 now. <laughs> like bask in my greatness. You know, was, that's awesome. Hell yeah, man. Man, I could sit here and talk to you all day, but I got, I know you got a show you got to get ready yeah, for. Yeah. I got to get back to sound check here soon. Kind enough to play a, a little bit of music for us. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, I, I did want to say, um, uh, for those not familiar, I did a cocktail book called Punk Rock and Cocktails, and you were kind enough to let me include uh, your art and talk about uh, you guys in that book, and I thought that was really cool. I just wanted to thank you for sure, officially for that. You were the second person I reached out to after Henry Rollins. I'm just okay. So, I'm just okay. So with, you know. I'm okay just with so that. You know. <laughs> just so you know, I thought that I thought that was really cool. So thanks thank for you. that. Um, thanks, man. Uh, in case you've been living under a rock, this is uh, BJ Barham from American Aquarium. Uh, where can uh, people find tour info and uh, if they want to buy a record or something like that? Uh, you can find our music anywhere you uh, buy, stream, steal music. Uh, <laughs> Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, uh, Pandora, Napster, uh, Tidal. Um, you can also find everything you need to if you want to actually buy it uh, like a respectable human being that supports the art. Uh, go to AmericanAquarium.com. Uh, you can buy it straight from the store there. Also, look at tour dates, uh, watch videos, all that good stuff. Uh, we're on social media. Um, Facebook and Instagram is American Aquarium, all one word. Twitter is U.S. Aquarium. Um, yeah, wherever you do your social media yeah, and, yeah. and listening to music, uh, you can tend to find us. All right. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you, brother. Cheers. Pack up your bags, babe. We're going for a drive. No, I can't tell you without ruin the surprise. Yeah, this winter just won't end. Lord knows what we've been through. It's been the kind of year that damn near broke us clean in two. So let's head down to the shoreline And wash off all this blame I swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name And try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago Out on the sinking sand a chick of my comical And I swear I'm gonna lose my mind If I have to hear about God's plan One more goddamn time 
I'm just staring at the sky Looking for an excuse Yeah, I never knew hard Until I took apart That room that never got used So let's head down to the shoreline Wash off all this blame I swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name Try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago Out on the sinking sands Check up my comical And I'll never pretend To know what you're going through But you ain't the only one Who lost something that day Honey, I lost him too So let's head down to the shoreline And wash off all this blame I swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name And try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago out on the sinking sands A chick of my comic Thank y'all. How's your mom and them? I hadn't seen your folks in ages. She was always kind, had the best sweet tea high school meat ever tasted. Weddings and funerals used to always get me down. These days they seem to be the only thing that ever bring me back to town. And I wish you'd have called me. Maybe I could have talked you down But the thing that I wish Most of all Is that you were still around Can't help but laugh about all the trouble that we got Into in the back of that short sugar's parking lot All the life we lived all the plans that we discussed Before Milwaukee's best snuck up and got the best of us And I wish you'd have called me Maybe I could have talked you down But the thing that I wish most of all Is that you were still around Still hear your voice when I cross that county line Waking up the echoes in the canyons of my mind Hold on to the good times, leave the bad ones for the plow It ain't goodbye forever, friend, it's just goodbye for now And I wish you'd have called me Maybe I could have talked you down But the thing that I wish most of all Is that you were still around I wish that you were still around Tell whoever's guitarist is, thank you for letting me borrow it. Like I said, he asked me.
Foxland Media. Think big.